Let's continue our study of classes as a contract by looking at a pseudo array list. One way to learn about how to design and implement classes is to examine how classes in the API were created. Now you actually could do this by reading the code in the API. It is available online at the Oracle website. But there's a problem with that. It's commercial code, which means that it's written in a much more sophisticated and complicated way than what we're accustomed to. So it's not as helpful as you might think. Instead, what we're going to do is redesign and work through parts of this class to show you the process for creating good classes. So I'm going to consider an array list of string, only I'm not going to use the generic. We really haven't programmed with generics yet, and so it makes sense to do it without it. The class name I'll use is string array list. I know it's not very original, but it'll work. So the properties of the string array list are going to come from the array list. The first property is homogeneity. This means that all of the items need to be strings. Then we need random access. Now this is a property we haven't talked about much. What it means is that we can reach any element in the array list in one operation. Now we know how that works because we saw it before. We know when you have an array, if you add the index to the address of the first element, that that will jump you to that position in the array. So when people say random access, what they mean is that the array should be the underlying data structure. Now you probably guessed that from the name of the class, and you probably also guessed it because array is the only data structure we have at this point. But there are other data structures, and you'll see them in the next semester. Of course, we're also going to zero index things. This isn't critical, but it is consistent with how things are done in Java, and so it's the right way to do them. And of course, there should be no gaps. All of the elements should be in adjacent indices. Now this is one of the ways in which ArrayList is different than arrays. Arrays could have gaps in them, but we can't with ArrayList, and we want to maintain that property. So let's talk about what the data fields should be. We know that all of our properties get stored in data, and that they're enforced by the methods. So for our data, we want an array of strings. So I'm going to call that string array data. Very clever, I know. We also need to know what the capacity of the array is going to be. Now, this will be stored as data.length in that field, but also we need to have a default capacity. So if the user doesn't tell us what size to make our string array list, this will be the capacity that we use. And we need to have a size that's an int. So the size is the one that changes up and down as you add and remove elements, and capacity is the size of the array overall. We're not going to do the extensible part, of the array list because that's a more complicated and advanced programming. If you continue programming, you'll see that next semester. We know for instance data that each object has to have its own copy of each instance data field. So for example, data and its associated field data.length that tells us how many elements are in the array definitely have to be instance data. Because if we have two different string array lists, they would each need to have their underlying array separate. Size also needs to be instance data, because each one of those array lists could have a different size at any given time. So that means they need their own copy, classic instance data. Now we do have some class data in this class, and it's the default capacity. So all of the objects in this class are going to share a single default capacity. It should be a constant, and it should be class data. The class data is what makes it shared. Remember the keyword for this is static. So this is what our UML looks like at this point. String array list is the name of the class, and the data that we have stored is a string array called data, an integer called size. We can see that those are instance data because they're not underlined, and then a default capacity, which is of type int, and that's class data because it is underlined. This is what the code would look like that implements the class at this point. Public class string array list, string square bracket data, int size, final static int, default capacity equals 10. Now 10 is what I picked up from the array list class. You might want to have a different default capacity. What's important though is that it be static so that all of the objects in the class share just one field and that it be final so that nobody can change it inside the class. The next thing we need to implement are constructors. Constructors are instructions on how to initialize instance data. 
Now we've actually been using constructors for quite a while, but our new adventure is writing our own constructors. The name of the constructor always matches the name of the class, and there's no return type. And that turns out to be a really easy mistake to make, is to put a return type on a constructor. Unfortunately, Eclipse cannot identify it as a syntax error because it isn't a syntax error. Eclipse will put a little yellow warning flag up, so don't ignore those if you see them. Typically, classes have many constructors. And in fact, as a general rule, having a lot of constructors is a good thing. So don't try to pare it down to any kind of minimum. Now, in standard UML, you don't show constructors. But frankly, I do, because I found that if I don't show constructors in the UML, my students sometimes forget to implement them. And then things go really, really badly in their programs. So here's what the UML looks like at this point. The top two boxes are the same before. And now we have two constructors. We have one that's just a default constructor that doesn't have any parameters. So that one will construct an array with the default capacity. And then we have one that has a capacity parameter. Once again, remember instance data not underlined, class data is underlined. There's a trick for writing multiple constructors that's really cool. What you do is you write the constructor with the most parameters first, and then you call this constructor to implement the others. There's some special syntax for this. It uses this, and then the arguments go there. I'll show you an example. The thing that's good about this is the strategy reduces bugs in constructors. Let's say, for example, that you have to change some instance data in the class. You hope you aren't going to have to make these kind of changes, but sometimes you have to. It can be really hard to forget to go through and change every single one of the constructors by hand. So by writing the most general constructor first, and then having all of the other constructors call that, it means you only have to make the change in one place, and all of the other constructors get adjusted correctly. Really a great thing. Let me show you how it works. So you'll notice I've implemented the constructors here. The first constructor is the one that's the most general. So it takes the in capacity as a parameter. It constructs the data array to that capacity and sets the size to be 0. Now take a look at how the second one was written. This is the one that uses a default capacity. So what you do is you call this, which in this particular instance means call the constructor with a single integer argument from the default capacity. Very easy to do. So let's look at some general rules for this. Non-constant data fields are almost always instance data. Not always, there are some exceptions. But if you start with this rule, you'll be right most of the time. Constants are always going to be class data, because there's no reason to create multiple copies of a constant. And we need to make sure that every instance data field is properly initialized by every single constructor. And one really great way to do this is using cascading constructors. So keep programming.